Hi, everybody. Welcome, welcome. Welcome so much to this Indies Unite uh, uh, webinar. Um, we are so excited for today's um, group of authors and this discussion. My name is Justin Calusiestes. I'm a manager of Little Shop of Stories, which is an independent bookstore in Decatur, Georgia. Um, I'm just going to introduce a little bit about Indies Unite and then turn it over to our moderator at, to introduce the panelists. And so um, we'll get underway. Uh, Indies Unite is a collaborative project which offers uh, a series of hard hitting virtual events that challenge the status quo, question our current standards and leave no curiosity left unexplored. Uh, past programming has included conversations focused on anti-racism, immigration, and the intersection of food and culture. Our participating bookstores are Blue Manatee Literacy Project, Boogie Down Books, Little Shop of Stories, Monkey See, Monkey Do Children's Bookstore, Politics and Prose, River Dog Book Company, and Second Star to the Right Bookstore. Um, and of course, there's a big thanks to Bookshop for all that they do to support Indies Unite and for hosting today's event. Um, it would not happen if it weren't for uh, the efforts of bookshop.org. So we thank them so very much. Um, our moder moderator for today's event is Kim Johnson, who is the author of This Is My America. Kim Johnson has held leadership positions in social justice organizations as a team. She's now a college administrator who maintains civic engagement throughout the community while also mentoring black student activists and leaders. This is My America is her debut novel. It explores racial injustice against innocent black men who are criminally sentenced and the families left behind to pick up the pieces. She holds degrees from the University of Oregon and the University of Maryland College Park. Kim lives in Oregon with her husband and two kids. And now, um, I will get out of your way. Take it, uh, uh, take it away, Kim. Thank you, Justin. Um, thank you, Indies Unite. I am so excited for this panel. Um, and I'm so, it's such an honor to, to moderate it. Um, I'm gonna first do introductions of this amazing group of authors. Um, the first is Kendra Neely, who is an artist and writer based in Southern Oregon. Her art journey began with an amazing community and encouragement she received at Umpqua Community College. She took her first drawing class, Drawing Nature, at UCC, and she still hikes the trails regularly to sketch flowers and ferns. Numb to this is her debut graphic novel. Um, next, we have uh, Gilly Siegel, who is the New York Times bestselling author of and the NAACP Image Award nominated novel of I'm Not Dying With You Tonight. Um, and also the authors of We Will Fly. Uh, she grew up in Florida, attended Hebrew University and Emory School of Law. She's currently the chief legal officer of an advertising agency. And um, uh, Marika Nijkamp is the number one New York Times bestselling author of This Is Where It Ends and Before I Let Go. She is a storyteller, dreamer, globetrotter, geek, uh, holds degrees in philosophy, history, and medieval studies, and has served as an executive member of the We Need Diverse Books and is the founder of Diversify YA. Uh, she lives in the Netherlands. Um, you can find all of these wonderful offers on their um, social media sites and websites. For, um, for Kendra, Twitter and Instagram is at Kendra Neely. Um, for um, Gilly, it's visit Gilly, sorry, visit <laughs> GillySiegel.com. And for um, Marika is AmericanNightCamp.com. And we will um, introduce Kimberly Jones when Kimberly is arriving. Um, I wanna just sort of jump into questions because that's what we're all here for is this wonderful conversation with incredibly thoughtful um, and thought provoking authors. Uh, and for me, this, this, um, this panel feels particularly salient because I was so drawn to all of these authors for so many different reasons. Um, I read both uh, This Is Where It Ends and I'm Not Dying With You Tonight as soon as they were released. They were immediate reads for me. Um, and as someone who grew up in Oregon and worked at a university and um, was there at the time of what happened at Elk Community College, um, I just was so incredibly um, moved by the work that um, Kinder did with her um, graphic novel. And so, my first question um, goes to Kendra. 
Um, you know, none to this, your graphic novel was released this last month. So congratulations. Um, you know, you, um, you in, in your work, you know, you detail the 2015 Umpqua Community College shooting in Oregon, um, which you survived and, um, and along with the aftermath, as you so poignantly detailed working to heal amid a society where that trauma connects you continually with repeated shootings. Um, there was an excellent NPR piece on you. So please look out for that. Um, it's called Mass Shooting Survivor, Oregon Wrote Graphic Novel Memoir. Um, I, I would love for you to share um, with everyone um, how writing this book and your art have helped in your healing journey. And then um, the follow-up question is how can schools use your book to help students cope with anxiety around school shootings? I love that those questions are together um, because I think that that just works so well for what I you know, have to share about how this book helped me heal. Um, for me, when I was younger in teenage um, years, I really struggled with uh, finding a way to talk about my emotions and um, she, she expressed that with other people. And so having the book, having something that I had to sit down every day and work through my brain, work through those kind of um, learned habits of hiding away those difficult emotions or not dealing with them, having that structure of having to come to it every single day and face it at the table, but it also being my choice that I was doing it was really helpful. Um, it helped me to not shy away from it, but work in a way that worked for me. Emotions can be really difficult sometimes to get down with just prose and having the ability to draw and um, work through art a little bit to help express everything that I was feeling was uh, kind of the right path for me when dealing with it. And so when we look at how, you know, how we can use this as a tool to help, uh, especially kids in high school and middle school, um, we think about you know those connections and having just another accessible avenue to not only you know personally read and self reflect and and think about those ideas in yourself but something to point to when you're talking to your trusted adults about how you're feeling yeah i mean i, I think that's what i love so much because you could really get a sense of how difficult it would be to communicate and 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 art is such an incredible way to do that um visual art um thank you um, my next question is for um, marika you know washington review of independent books writes books like this is where it ends gives readers a safe space for experiencing a terrifying reality uh, this book opens up a door for questions and discussions that can help better understand school violence and perhaps even lead us toward a solution and for anyone attending, working, or volunteering in schools, I, I really do think that this is uh, where it ends as an essential read. Um, really, what inspired you to write This Is Where It Ends? And what would you like readers to take away uh, from reading it? Um, I think to, to maybe at least partially start with that second question, um, I, I approach This Is Where It Ends very much from a from the perspective of wanting to understand too, wanting to have that safe space to, to discuss, um, you know, difficult matters uh, and, and certainly something that is, that is, that has touched so many lives as, as uh, gun violence and gun violence at schools. Um, and, and I, 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 I tell this story when I do school visits. Um, the first time I came to the United States was a few weeks, I think, yeah, a few weeks after the, the Sandy Hook shooting. Um, and it's that that coincided with um, a a break in in my home. So it was just like I I I spent the entire day you know reading the news and figuring out what was going on, and then came home to this this weird situation um, of seeing everything you know destroyed and and uh, tossed and then turned. Um, and it's it, it it was something that had been that 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 was basically on my mind, you know, at the back of my mind in, in the, the, the weeks, the days after that, the weeks after that. And, and then I came to the United States and went to lunch with a friend of mine. And we were somewhere in New Jersey um, and passed the school bus, you know, yellow school buses. Um, I'd never seen one in real life before. I'd only ever seen them in movies. Uh, because like I'm Dutch, we very true to stereotype all bike to school. That's that's sort of what happens. Um, and that that 
you know, trigger that, you know, the, 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 those, all of those questions that I've been in the back of my mind for, you know, the better part of a couple of weeks of, of how can, can something this heinous happen? How, why mostly, not, not just so much how, but why? And I started talking to a friend of mine who it turned out was an avid collector of guns, um, very into gun culture, which is also not something that I'm, you know, personally wasn't very familiar to at that point. Um, and, and I realized that we came to this, this conversation to, from two very separate viewpoints. And it left me with far more questions than answers. And what I do when I have questions about the world, about anything, is I turn to books. And what I was looking for, honestly, at that point was a book that focused on the experience of you know, going through a traumatic event like that. And everything I read was, you know, a lot of nonfiction too, but a lot of books that, that dealt with the aftermath of, sh of a shooting, that dealt with, dealt with the, you know, the weeks leading up to uh, an event like that. And really, I couldn't find anything that, that sort of focused on those, those minutes, those moments where your entire life is turned upside down. And I realized that I still had so many questions I wanted to see if I can could find a way to explore those in fiction and to you know go back to what I said earlier to have that that safe space to you know just for me personally figure out those questions but also maybe hopefully create a a safe environment where teen readers could you know deal with those too could could see their their fears or their experiences reflected or have a a starting point to have conversations like that in their in, at home in their communities and all of that and that's that's what this um turned into or at least i hope it turned into but that's what i heard from from many readers since and that's also honestly how i hope it's being used to just have those conversations because it's often so much easier to have a a you know safe fictional environment to talk about difficult subjects than to you know immediately go to the the, the personal um so that's that's how it came to be mostly. Yeah, and I think that there's so many connections between both you and Kendra and, you know, Kendra's graphic novel talks about coming from Texas to Oregon and then being so shocked by uh, it, jarring because it was so different and, and you being um, coming into the country and then covering the aftermath. Uh, again, for, for both of you, um, although Kendra's novel sort of covered the before um, and the continued after. Um, my next question is for the dynamic duo of Gilly and Kimberly Jones. Um, I want to make sure that you all know who Kimberly Jones is. Kimberly Jones is the New York Times bestselling author of the NAACP Image Award nominated novel, I'm Not Dying With You Tonight. Uh, she's a former manager of the bookstore Little Shop of Stories and currently works in the entertainment industry and lives in Atlanta in Georgia. And I say, I say dynamic duo because you both really just seem to have such a beautiful collaboration and friendship. I mean, I just, every time I see you both um, yeah, together and, and talking about the way that you do your work um, and, and how your friendship is based, I mean, it's so inspiring to see, and I wish I had a, a duo to write with. It would help so much uh, with storytelling. Um, and, you know, you're, you all are both so talented. You've been featured on Good Morning America and countless media outlets. Um, and I'm Not Dying With You really follows two teen girls, one black and white, and, and adds to, I think, this conversation of the complexity and thinking about um, the additional layers of violence, um, thinking about systemic racism and the varying community responses to these issues. Um, so both your novels um, that you've collaborated on um, have symbolized um, ways in which uh, you all can work together um, to solve the greatest problems of our time, from gun violence, human rights, to fighting for equal, um, for equity and justice. So what advice do you have for teen activists or teens in general, um, young people, middle schoolers, um, who oftentimes have varying perspectives and experiences, how they can come together to collaborate on solving these issues that they feel so passionately about? That was a mouthful, but I know you guys got it. <laughs> Yeah, I would say the first thing, um, first of all, thank you for that lovely introduction. And I apologize to the panel for being late. I just could not get Zoom figured out today. And then I was like, I just toss it all into the browser and it'll get figured out. So my apologies. Um, 
I would say the first thing that I would say is don't rush into activism. Um, I can say that as someone who does social justice work um, full time, Geely also does a lot of social justice work um, as well. It's, it's, it's an undertaking and it's an undertaking for me as a middle-aged woman um, and it is a heavy burden to bury. So it's not something that you should run into uh, haphazardly, lightheartedly, lightheartedly, definitely don't do it for clout because clout will come back and get you in the end because every bit of attention you draw that's like, yay, you, you're going to draw an equal or sometimes more attention that's going to go boo you, you know what I mean? And so you have to be prepared for that going into it. The other thing I would say is that we all don't have to do the same thing. You are not required to respond, react, participate in, give acknowledgement to every ill of the world. Find something that you're passionate about that aligns with the gifting that you already have and focus your energy on that. If you are an amazing painter and you care about the environment, there's your lane. You are not responsible for police brutality, for women's health issues, for, you know, for medical fairness, um, for um, mental health awareness. No, we, ha we have gotten to the place where we like, for some reason, have a disdain for mastery, which I don't understand. Um, everyone is a self-appointed philosopher on all points these days. And it's problematic because what it is, it's making us have a generation of unpaid interns for propaganda. And that's not a good thing. And so the main thing that we need to focus on is what are you good at? If you're passionate about art, if you're a prolific painter, and then you also are really concerned about how the environment is affecting your community, that's where you focus your engine because you're going to be excited about it. You're going to learn about it. You're going to be engaged in a way where you understand that you have to exercise emotional maturity uh, to go through the difficulties get to the point where you're able to talk to people who have a differing opinion from you. I love that I came in right as you were talking about having that conversation with someone who's on the, the other side of the fence. We cannot speak in an echo chamber 24 seven and think we're gonna actually have change. Like this, this idea that if someone thinks differently of you, then they are the trash of the earth. And I'm not talking about people who are spouting harmful rhetoric. I'm talking about people who just have a difference of opinion. You have to learn to, to be able to work together on the things that you do agree upon and be able to call them in or call them out about the things that you dif uh, disagree on. So I would say to young people, don't feel pressure to rush in because as the old people say, fools rush in, you know what I mean? And so you gotta know what you're passionate about know what you care about, know what, what tidbits of information you've mastered, have the emotional maturity to speak with people who don't agree with you 100%, release yourself from an echo chamber where you're always just hearing what it is that you want to hear and, and then move accordingly. And Gilly, you're muted. <laughs> oh, I did it. I unmuted myself in time before and then I didn't this time. <laughs> Um, the only thing that I would add to that is if you are not a directly affected member, right, if you are seeking to ally to a community that is suffering harm and you are not a member of that marginalized community, listen first, right, enter into this allyship humbly and listen and ask what the community itself needs and desires, right, out of, from a very good place, oftentimes we find ourselves, particularly when we're new to activism, rushing in and making presumptions about what the community that you're seeking to support needs or wants, and we're, we're overstepping, we're misstepping, and we're elevating our own voice rather than elevating the voices of the community itself, so if, particularly if you're new to activism, enter into the space, Kind of humbly and, and listen first and and find a relationship like Kim and I have this relationship where we can talk very openly and very, and very freely about things, but we spent years building that together, right? So if you're new to this relationship, you need to work on building it as a human being first and being able to ask the community that's affected, um, what do you want and what do you need and how can I utilize my gifts and my talents and my passions to support you as opposed to presuming that I know the answer for a community of which I'm not a member. You know, both of those answers that you shared really line up well with the question I have, and which I did not share with you all, so I'm so excited, because it really is about understanding the community and what the community needs at the time. And, and when you think about, I was really struck by the lines in Kinder's work on speaking on um, trauma responses along with everyone else. So when none to this, 
there was a line that said, you can't really be hopeful or resilient if you haven't processed that what you've been through threatens those feelings. And this is where it ends. There was a line that said, grief is one big gaping hole, isn't it? It's everywhere and all consuming. Some days you think you, you can't go on because the only thing waiting for you is more despair. And then I'm not dying with you tonight. There was a line when you push people to their breaking point and they ain't got no power, they'll find a way to take it. What's so wrong with that? Um, so much of this is about understanding. Um, and so I, I would love for you all, we'll, we'll start with Kendra um, and then we'll, um, we'll go from there. You know, do you have any advice for students or school teachers dealing with anxiety and trauma, especially when people are coming at it at, at different ways of their own understanding? Um, and then how do you find hope? Um, for advice, I'd say uh, never stop talking about how you feel about it. Um, I think there's a lot of people that will try to talk over you. Um, and uh, one of the best things you can do is to just keep saying your truth. And if that evolves, then that evolves. But like definitely just keep talking about it and be insistent about your feelings with people. Um, and finding hope, I, I don't know. I, I feel like... Um, part of the healing process that's kind of difficult to capture is that like when you're in when you're in the bad you know kind of spot when it, when it's really really bad that's it feels very all consuming but as soon as you take a step out of it that almost like that those feelings almost completely fade away and so you you kind of get this like thought of like why did I ever feel that way or like I can't you know I, I don't know how I found this hope or how I found this happiness because, um, you know, realistically, not a lot has changed about my situation. You know, there's, I've still gone through that and there are still mass shootings that continue to um, affect my mental health and, and bring me back to that place, but it's just not as all consuming now. Um, but I, I don't know, I, there's just something, there's just something in me now and I don't know how I got it. And I wish I did, because I would love to help other people find it too. Um, and maybe just sharing, the fact that you can get to that place is in itself um, sharing that hope. Thank you. And Marietta? I would definitely say in terms of, of dealing with anxiety, dealing with trauma, um, like Andra said, to have that conversation, be continue to talk to people about it, continue to have like if you can create safe spaces where people can share their feelings, can share their anxieties, can share what is bothering them without even necessarily like it, it would be, it would be so perfect if we just had answers to everything. Obviously those don't exist, but being able to talk about the things that bother you, the things that, um, you know, weigh you down um, is, is so incredibly important. Um, and obviously too, like schools can't fix this completely. Um, and, and, and especially when you're dealing with like heavy traumas, um, it's, it is super helpful. And I can speak from experience there. It's super helpful to talk to a therapist, to talk to a professional. Um, so definitely do, you know, if you have access to those routes, um, take them and, and, and don't be afraid to do so. Um, but I think the, the other side too, in, in terms of finding hope, um, for me, it's, it, it's very much like the other side of the coin from having those conversations about trauma and having, having those conversations about hard experiences is knowing that having that sense of recognition and having that sense of community and having people who, you know, maybe understand what you're going through or at least are able to give you the space to explore it all and give you, you know, the supporting um, words or, or gestures or, or anything to, to um to deal with it, um, I think that that for me is is very much where hope can come from. Um, just knowing that you're not alone, knowing that other people have made it through, um, will hopefully continue to make it through, um, and and you know being reminded of this this like common humanity that we all have, um, even even in the the you know hardest hardest times, um, and and beyond that, honestly. Um, it, it, it's a different kind of trauma, but I've been dealing with, you know, uh, as, as all of us, um, the pandemic as a, uh, and especially too, as a disabled person, um, I've, I found myself needing to, you know, if you have the opportunity, go outside, um, spend some time just breathing in the air 
looking at trees, looking at flowers, looking at like listening to birdsong, anything like that, just to occasionally ground yourself and feel yourself connected to, um, you know, the world around you. I think to me, connection is, is the essence of hope. Illy? Um, <clears throat> one thing that I think it's really important to remember is that grief and trauma and healing look really different for different people. And I, I think sometimes there's out of either our own discomfort or out of a desire for people to be okay, we push moving on before survivors are really necessarily ready for that. And so if you're engaging particularly with children, like I think it's really important to hold space for big emotions and difficult emotions and tears, even after you personally would like to have moved on from a situation because not everybody is gonna experience this journey at the same rate or pace or speed. And so out of your own discomfort or desire for healing, it's, it's important not to push people beyond the place that they're ready to be themselves in the moment. Kimberly. Yeah, I would, I, I definitely would say like find organizations who specialize in this kind of recovery. Um, there are a lot of amazing organizations um, who offer free group. Group is amazing because there is nothing like realizing that you're not the only one. <laughs> there is nothing like realizing that people have a shared um, lived experience with you and that and those are the people sometimes I go to group um, and those are the people sometimes who when it's been a year when it's been two years and as Geely said the world is telling you it's been two years why aren't you over it why are you still triggered by a blue light why are you still triggered by a loud sound um those are the people who understand that it's a process and that truthfully this expectation that we're going to get to the promised land of feeling better baby it may not ever it may not ever come you may be, get better at grappling with it uh you may be less triggered by it you may have better processing systems but you realistically may not ever get over you know i witnessed i've talked about this on different platforms i witnessed my first murder and notice I said first, not the only. I witnessed my first murder when I was 15 years old. I feel teary-eyed right now and I'm 46. So I'm not sure there's ever gonna be a day we're talking about a shooting, we're talking about this level of trauma that I'm just gonna be over it or okay. And that's okay. Like, that's the thing that I had to do for myself was recognize that, like, that's okay. It's okay that it still may bother me. It drives my passion for why I want a better lived experience for other 15-year-olds. You know what I mean? And so I feel like people finding a space with other people who know personally and internally what that journey looks like is, is extremely helpful. Yeah, that's wonderful. Um, I've got two more questions and then we're gonna open it up to questions from the audience. So I hope that they uh, pop in your questions in the question box. Um, I, I wanna to turn to the, the writer hat, the artist hat for a moment. Um, when, when working on subjects that deal with traumatic experiences or bearing witness to sort of the realities um, that young people are facing, I often do hear a pushback to not even write about these topics or why I write about these topics. But I have always found that young people in um, work every day are grounded in these realities that we've been talking about, mental health, violence, injustice, trauma, and just the complexities of life. And so um, what do you see as the impact on young people to create these spaces and opportunities through text, through graphic novels, um, to explore these topics and the value of them? And um, We'll go backwards now. I'm going to start with Kimberly, with Gilly, Marieka, and Kendra. So, um, Kim. I'm sorry, can you repeat the question for me one more time? Yeah, sorry about that. Um, so, what do you see as the impact on writing about these types of topics and creating a space for them to reflect and connect um, uh, on topics that often people don't really want to talk about? The one thing that I could say is that we underestimate how intellectually savvy children are. 
we super we super underestimate their ability to add to this conversation in a way that can push the needle forward. Gili and I have rarely attended a school um, with "I'm not dying with you tonight," where kids didn't say where kids said consistently, "Was this a, is this about my school?" Because we had an incident just like this at my school. Or, oh my God, did you guys read about us in the newspaper? Because this happened at our school. The amount of times that Gili and I heard that on, on our tour was devastating to us. It was devastating to us how many kids connected with, with this traumatic shooting that takes place in the book. And so we actually met a teacher really quickly. I'll tell this about, uh, we were at an event and we met a teacher from Ferguson. Um, and he was telling us that he is not even the literature teacher. I think he was like, what, the music teacher, Geely? Was he the, <laughs> the chorus teacher? He was the chorus teacher. Um, and he said that he realized that his kids in Ferguson had never processed the civil unrest of Ferguson. They were now at this time when he was talking to us in high school, but they were in middle school um, when the civil unrest of Ferguson happened. And he said, as the music teacher, he had them read, I'm not dying with you tonight. And for the first time he watched his kids process their trauma of that experience, living through the book and using the book as a portal to enter into that conversation. And so kids are having the exact same lived experiences we are as we are living through the day-to-day -day traumas which seem to be like in overload over the past decade you know what i mean and it's like the fact that we aren't having these conversations with them is really sad but the beauty is young adult literature is is host for a lot of these difficult conversations which is why it's one of the reasons why i'm proud to be a YA author in this time is because this is where kids are entering the conversation. This is where they're finding space to gather together around it. This is a way that teachers have a tool to enter into um, to enter into those conversations. And I think it's important. And I think the world knows why it's important. I think the world knows it's important, which is why they're banning us. Um, all of that, <laughs> but also I think it's, it's critical to write about these topics for two reasons. One is you can't ignore things out of existence. And two, um, I believe in the depths of my soul that art is a portal into different, into difficult conversations. It might be hard to talk about what happened to you, to your family, what's being said at your dinner table, but if you can funnel backwards into a much closer experience by starting with talking about a fictional event and then get closer and closer to what happens in reality, like it can be an entry point that is otherwise difficult to find. And so I, I think all of art, by the way, not just literature, but um, plays and visual art and all of these are mediums by which we can help kids enter into what otherwise might be an intimidating or difficult conversation to have. And I, I think because of that, it's imperative that we continue to talk about difficult topics in art. Yeah, I, I honestly don't think I have much to add to that. I definitely get pushback too for this is where it ends um, and, and I get parents predominantly telling me that you know this is a far too heavy subject to you know write the, have their have their kids read books about um, and those are the same kids who since kindergarten have had shooter drills and have dealt with you know considering what to do in case of an active shooter event um, so it's it, it feels like such a disconnect and I think what Gili is saying too like you can't you can't ignore things out of existence and that's it feels like that's what they're trying to do. And I think it's so important to have these, these, these books, to have these fictional spaces um, to at least have, be able to have the conversation, but also um, like we talked about before, be able to tell people, hey, you're not alone in this. Like what you're dealing with is enti entirely valid. And this book at least recognizes that, sees what you're dealing with and, and I think it's it's so important to have books like that um, and have those those lifelines, um, especially during times that times of upheaval, times of anxiety, times of trauma. Um, it it it. I know so many people who've told me, and I know that feeling myself too, that their lives were saved by finding the right book at the right time. 
Um, and I think that that's why these books matter. And even if it's like just the one reader, then that's honestly everything I could ever hope for in pretty much my entire career. And that's, that's why I do this. Kendra? Yeah, I loved what Kimberly said earlier about how uh, we kind of underestimate kids and young people's uh, uh, ability to feel all the same things that adults are feeling. And um, we do, we have this idea that um, kids are more resilient to trauma or to um, these kind of devastating events that happen. And uh, that's not true. I don't know an adult alive today that has a vocabulary big enough, um, who is articulate enough to express all of the complex feelings that we feel um, every day. And um, there is a lot of power in having adults just acknowledge that uh, kids and young people are dealing with these traumas and that they are affecting them. They're affecting their education, they're affecting their happiness and their health and their ability to um, have relationships with other peers and adults. Um, and so I, yeah, I, I think it's incredibly important for literature like this, whether it comes from, um, you know, uh, nonfiction or fiction, or um, um, like they were saying earlier, other forms of art uh, to express it. That's only going to help shape our society in a better place for the, for the next generation. You know, this week um, I was checking my daughter's backpack who she's eight and a half years old. And when I was checking her backpack, she said, what, are, are you looking for a weapon, mommy? Like that was her response. Um, I was looking for Halloween candy, but, but <laughs> that's what I, I was looking for, stickers. Um, but that's our young people, they, at, at that young age, they're hearing this stuff. So, um, so yeah, I just loved everything that you all said. Um, I do have questions from the, uh, from the audience. And the first one goes to Kendra. Um, the first is from Park East High School. So thank you, Park East High School, um, for your question. Um, and, and this one's a, a serious one, and it's really more about you. Um, and so, you know, after experiencing the shooting in Oregon, um, how did that change your view in life with what, how you feel comfortable sharing? And how old were you when that happened? Um, so I was 19 years old when that happened. So, um, and it was my second year of community college. And it, I think in, in kind of the immediate sense, it made me a very cynical and closed off person. Um, and, um, you know, that of course, uh, however you deal with smaller problems, um, you know, the kind of your way of dealing with stuff emotionally, that's only going to be exemplified when you're dealing with bigger um, traumas. And uh, what was working for me with much smaller things, um, what I thought was, you know, working well, uh, did not work very well for, for this big kind of complex thing. And uh, yeah, I mean, very closed off at first. Um, but then kind of as I started healing or just experienced a little bit of time before I kind of really started going to therapy and, and counseling and getting some of those resources, uh, my worldview was very much just kind of stuck in that time. I, I, I just kind of stayed there. I stayed 19 for a while. And I remember even, uh, I was getting into like an Uber at my, at my art college that I went to in, in Georgia. And, uh, the Uber driver said something about like, Oh, you know, are you going out tonight? You know, um, to go, go to go out and party or whatever. And I was, and I said out loud, no, I'm 19, even though I was like 22 years old at the time. And then I was like, and then I had that weird moment where I was like, Oh my gosh, wait, no, I can't, I can't correct myself now. I'm going to look like a crazy person. But I think that that kind of really encompasses how I felt, um, at that time, even for several years after. Thank you. That's such a beautiful example. Um, thank you. Um, for for um, uh, Marietta, did you address why it made you uncomfortable when you found out your friend was a gun collector? And if yes, what was their response? I did. Um, mainly we had a conversation about like differences in gun laws in the Netherlands versus uh, the US. Um, also, I 
very naively just through statistics and numbers at them, um, which is, you know, not a, mm -hmm. if you want to have a conversation and you want to get through to someone, um, or at least, you know, I definitely wanted to get through to them. Um, but if you want to have a conversation, it, it, it sort of bears listening to both sides um, and, and trying to understand both sides. And I think as the conversation progressed, we more or less got to that point where I tried to you know, understand where they were coming from, um, why guns were so important to them, why you know, growing up with guns was uh, such, such an important part of their identity. Um, and, and I hope I was able to, you know, also convey why, why it made me uncomfortable because I, I did tell them, um, and then why I couldn't understand it. Um, you know, the, the right to bear arms versus seeing so many people dead so far too often. Um, and that honestly, like I said, I'm, I'm not sure how we ended that conversation um, in the sense that I'm not sure if what I said got through to them, but it did change how I approached conversations like that going forward because it was so, because I realized while we were having it that, you know, my, my very strict point of view of this is, you know, this is how I think the world should work. And therefore that's, that's the right way. Um, you know, didn't, didn't get through to them at all, um, understandably. And it, it, it made me far more aware of how, you know, even with something like this, even with something where I still have very strong opinions about what I think is the right approach and what I think is important. Um, if you want to have that conversation, it bears listening and it bears trying to um, at least understand where someone's coming from and acknowledge that maybe you aren't going to agree, but that doesn't necessarily mean, and, and obviously like heinous comments and, and, and you know, fascists and Nazis excluded, um, but that doesn't, necessarily mean you don't respect someone but it means that you're going to have to continue to have those conversations and see where it leads down the road mm -hmm. because those seeds those seeds can grow um I, there's I, a I question so. for <laughs> i well i hope so with the, with enough yeah. with enough peppering of conversations um the, new, yeah. the needle the needle will move in some way i i think um there's a question for Kimberly. You're so well, you're so known for your activism, and so there's a question about what kind of activist groups are you part of, and how to manage activist groups and organizations and just engagement because I think it's 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 broad. So yeah, yeah. so I I belong to a few organizations. <laughs> I am the chief innovation officer for the People's Uprising, which is an organization here that was born out of the civil unrest of 2020. And we um, we have three areas in which we work at impacting. One is voting. Um, another one is um, equity and access for marginalized groups. Um, and then we um, have an entertainment and culture division that utilizes entertainment and culture um, to educate people. For example, um, one of the things that we just did recently was this past Saturday, we had a music festival that was headlined mm -hmm. by Gucci Mane that had um, Amaretta the Great, who's a new artist, um, Dormani, and several other artists. And um, young people under the age of 30 were able to get free tickets as long as they early voted. So as long as they showed proof that they early voted, um, they were able to come. You could not buy tickets to the festival. You could, you could only get a ticket if you early voted um, and came out. And we gave away 4,000 tickets of young to young people, I think about we, at the end about 2,500 of them actually came to the concert, but 4,000 tickets were given away to young people who early voted. So we do initiatives like that um, via like our equity and access. Um, we had we just recently had a trade school fair. We did lots and lots of research and 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 showed that there was more um, 
equal playing field of equity across the board when Americans were more trade based. And so we created a trade school fair and a trade school scholarship to try to get people back into trade schools, plumbing, electrical work, cosmetology, uh, things like that. And then we also had trade level jobs. They are hiring people on the spot like 911, the sheriff's department, fire. Um, EMT, those departments um, to get um, marginalized people back into well paying jobs um, that give them something they can be proud of and put them in a position where they can purchase homes and things like that. And so that's the kind of work we do at the, Pe the People's Uprising, which is where I predominantly do um, my work. I'm also a founding member of Revolutionary Healing, which is a free healing retreat that happens every third Sunday of the month for Black and Indigenous people. Um, we let the Indigenous people of the land uh, lead the healing retreat. We give honor to um, the tribes that are Indigenous to the land that we're on. It's in a different location um, every month. It also travels globally. We're going to be in Panama um, at the top of the year doing a, a Revolutionary Healing Retreat, and it is completely free. 100% free for Black and Indigenous people to attend Revolutionary Healing. And then lastly, I'm also a member of the Georgia Entertainment Caucus. And the Georgia Entertainment Caucus uses arts and entertainment um, to acknowledge and give credit and support to artists um, who may not have done it before. So our organization is responsible for the Black Music and Entertainment Walk of Fame, which is right outside the Mercedes-Benz Stadium here in Atlanta. And it's just like, um, you know, the Hollywood Walk of Fame where you see all of the stars, but it acknowledges um, African Americans um, in the entertainment industry. Um, and we have a really beautiful, they gave us some really beautiful real estate in order to start uh, putting, so instead of stars, we give crowns, um, the crown mm -hmm. jewel. Um, and so we just did our, recently did our third installment of the crown jewels, and we've been able to acknowledge some really amazing Black artists who have not been acknowledged in other spaces. It's amazing. And you always hear so much from, from people about, I don't have time. Mm. I don't have time. And um, find things that you're passionate about because then you do, you, 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 you adjust your time and you focus on the things that are important to you. And clearly you don't have, yeah. you don't have uh, 24 hours more than we do. We got the same 24 hours. So. <laughs> and you know what? I'll say this. And it's, it's cause like, small chunks, right? Like I have specific things I do at TPU. I have specific things that I do at Revolutionary Healing. I have specific things that I'm responsible for at GEC. And I don't do more than that. I don't volunteer to do more than that. I do the things that I wanna do. And a test that I, I had a family member who kept arguing with me that they don't have time to do social justice work or to give back or to volunteer. And I told them two things. I said, the first thing I'm gonna tell you, there's a million teams you can start that is easy breezy. You can do a March uh, walk, a March of Dimes team, a, a cancer team, and all you have to do is get yourself a team and raise a little money and do a 5K. You can do that annually and it won't take up much of your time because that's the kind of stuff that I used to do back in the day before I got this engrossed in social justice work. Is I always had some kind of team. I had kidney teams and March dime teams and cancer teams and all the teams. The second thing I tell them is use utilize your phone. Look at your phone and see much how much screen time you have given to the screen every week. And then all I'm asking you to do is take 10% of that time and commit it to a nonprofit. Take 10% of the time that you consistently use on screens every week and find an organization you're passionate about. And even if, if that boils down to being like four hours a week, tell them, I would like to give four hours a week to this organization. Mm -hmm. The other thing that I'll is. The other thing I'll jump in there and add that we often forget is you don't have to, so we, Kim and I talk a lot about wingspan, right? Like in the course of a month or a couple of months, you touch people, places, and organizations as a routine matter. Look within your pre-existing wingspan and see what's happening there. This doesn't have to be a brand new thing that you go out and do. Like I'm a really, I am very involved in my own faith community, my synagogue. So like the very first place that I looked was what is my synagogue doing? And so if you have a pre-existing faith-based community, community center, or, um, you know, hiking or whatever it is, like you don't have to Ooh. automatically look outside of your existing wingspan, look within your wingspan. And there might be something that you are already contributing time to that you can allocate some of that time to the work that you're passionate about. Mm -hmm. We've got about two more minutes. 
um, before I ask you all one really, really quick question, uh, but this one goes to, to Gilly with a follow up with that is um, a question came from the audience about what was something you needed to learn about before using your voice to advocate for others. So this is about allyship and engagement. Um, it's okay to not know everything, right? I think uh, <laughs> you don't know all of the ins and outs of everything, and that does not make you a bad person, and it does not make you a bad ally. What it means is the first thing you need to do is listen and learn, and then you start stepping into action. But I, I think a lot of times we're all like, I want to be on the right side of history. And yes, we all do, and we all should strive to do that. But it's okay to start from a place of saying, I don't know. I don't know yet. Um, that doesn't make you bad. What you are obligated to do as a human being is to get better. We don't know what we don't know. And so start your journey with, I don't know, and, and starting to learn and seek out those people who have taken as their calling. Not every person who's experiencing trauma or marginalization has taken upon themselves the calling of being an educator. So don't demand that someone who doesn't want to be involved in educating you educate you, but seek out the voices that have self selected, have chosen to be educators in the space and start hearing from them first. Great, great advice. My last question for y'all before we end and hear um, from uh, Justin is, what are you working on next? Kendra, is there um, something, something boiling in the fire you can share? Um, yeah, I am uh, currently working on pitching my next book uh, with Little Brown, uh, actually Little Brown Inc. because they just, uh, I think they're about to Oh shoot, I hope I didn't just spill the basil out of you. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> I think oh, it was them. Knowledge. Um yeah, they're gonna have a, a, an imprint for the for graphic novel section, um, which is great because they, you know, they've just kind of implemented having graphic novels um in, in with that publisher. But um yeah, I'm I'm working on a pitch uh about uh my uh my life and growing up um as a queer youth in Texas and in the Bible Belt. And um, it's not going to be, it's not going to be as uh, heavy, I think, as none to this was, um, maybe implementing a lot more humor um, into it, but still, you know, touching on the difficult aspects of uh, growing up in kind of fundamental Christian, white Christian society and, um, and kind of how that affected my relationships with others and, and myself. Great. All right, Um, So I, I, earlier this year, my most recent YA came out at the end of everything, um, which also deals with trauma and, and injustice in the sense that it follows a group of teens in a juvenile uh, treatment facility um, who are left abandoned when a deep lake breaks out and they have to learn to fend for themselves. And it's very much a story about uh, a group of scenes um, a group of, of, of relatively abandoned and, 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 and uh, discarded teens learning to trust themselves and learning to trust each other and learning to find ways to survive. Um, so if you are if you feel like reading about pandemics and, and other dis difficult topics during a pandemic, <laughs> um, it was very healing for me to write it and, and to put in a lot of uh, anger um and and anger at injustice that i was seeing um so that came out earlier this year and then i think next year my middle grade graphic novel with the with art by the amazing sylvia by is coming out it's called ink girls and it's about um two girls in a renaissance type world who take on the patriarchy by means of free press awesome great <laughs> and then really quickly gilly and kimberly Anything got cooking? Gilly, um, speak for so the house. <laughs> <laughs> we have solo projects actually that uh, that, that we're working on. Um, I I'll just turned in a round okay, of revisions on um, a Captain Marvel novel that I wrote for for Marvel. So that's been really fun, and um, I will never be cooler in my own children's eyes than when I put them <laughs> I got to write Captain Marvel. <laughs> awesome, Kimberly. So I am um, working on a, a new um, adult fiction for Henry Holt called The Robot Lady, which is my mother's biography. Um, mm -hmm. And it is centered around my mom, who in 1976 programmed robots that delivered the mail in the Sears Tower. Wow, that's amazing. Cool. That's amazing. It's been a pleasure. Um, this was a wonderful, wonderful panel, thoughtful, caring people. 
Um, I'm so honored to now say I know you all. <laughs> um, Justin. Hi. Oh my gosh. What an amazing, amazing panel. I have enjoyed every minute listening to y'all talk. It just, it fills my soul with um, just so much uh, energy going forward. Uh, I love your books and, and I, I feel like I'm, I'm better for having heard what y'all have had to say. It's very exciting. Um, I just want to say on behalf of Indies Unite, thank you, Kim. Thank you to the panelists, uh, Geely, Kim, Kendra, Marike. Um, this is really fantastic. Uh, this um, is a little project that we came together um, and over the pandemic to try and make sense of the world. And, and I uh, genuinely, I, I feel like you guys have, have helped in that endeavor. Um, I just wanted to say again, uh, thank you to uh, the participating bookstores of Indy, Indies Unite. And of course, bookshop.org, which um, has uh, you know, done so much for this organization and for independent bookstores um, and for putting together great programming like this. Thank you all so very, very much. And, um, and I can't wait to see those forthcoming, forthcoming books. That's going to be really amazing. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much.